Hello, Higher Side Chatters. My name is Jonathan. I'm the April 2015 Money Bomb winner. I'm still in shock about it, actually. Uh, you know, when Greg emailed me that I had won, I kind of didn't believe it at first, but then he sent me the money, and you know, I kind of had a little outbreak there at work yesterday. <laughs> so thank you, Greg, and thank you to all the Higher Side Chatters that donate to the show, um, as, as well as myself. Um, I'm a fairly new listener. I've been listening to the podcast for about a month, but I've actually been trying to catch up with older episodes. Um, I felt like I had to sign up for the THC Plus. The extra hour is so worth it, in my opinion. And to anybody that hasn't signed up for it yet, you're missing out. And this is a great podcast. If you think so, too, you should definitely sign up for Plus. As far as what I plan to use the money for, I'm actually planning to use it to pay off one of my school classes. And then I'm going to check out uh, one of those t-shirts. I really love that logo, actually. That's kind of what got me into the show. Uh, I saw that logo and I was like, hmm, that looks interesting. And then I checked out a podcast and I've been hooked ever since. Who would I recommend to come on the show? I would recommend Vani Hari, the food babe, uh, to talk about the food industry in general and GMOs and how that's negatively affecting our health. I think she's a great speaker. Uh, and a food activist. I've been following her for a few years now. So I'd definitely be interested in seeing her come on the show. All right, thanks everybody. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. All right, people, we spend a lot of time exploring how our ancient past might give us clues to our messed up modern matrix of control, and today is no different. I have with me Bob Frizzell, who is the author of several books, but is probably best known for Nothing in This Book is True, but it's exactly how things are, which is 300 pages covering a vast history of Atlantis, Lumeria, and more before Sumeria. Uh, also, Sacred Geometry, Ancient Mystery Schools of Egypt, The Puppet Masters of the Power Pyramid, Achieving Christ Consciousness, Ascended Masters, UFOs, and all the things we love so much. I know I'm psyched to have him here, so let's get the ball rolling. Bob, my man, welcome to THC. How are you? Boy, that's a lot of stuff to put into one book. <laughs> <laughs> it is, or one sentence. Yeah, really. You did a good job of uh, getting it all out there, i got to tell you. <laughs> I've had a lot of practice, but... Uh, you yeah, have, yeah. It's it's great to have you here, man. I really do enjoy the book. Yeah, well, thank you. It's great to be here. So I do want to thank you for for having me on. And uh, I got to tell you, I just love talking about this stuff. It, it's it is my passion. So you know, let's just uh, let's just have some fun and just uh, cover some ground here and see what we can come up with. <laughs> I like it. So yeah, I thought the book was great. It covers a whole bunch of interesting threads connecting all those things I just mentioned. But because it is so expansive, I have to ask you, what was it that really got you walking this path? What really got you digging into this suppressed information? Do you really want to know? (laughs) (laughs) Well, okay, here we go. Uh, Greg, I got to tell you, my story is probably just a little, little bit different from from others. (laughs) A bit unique, I'd say. I, I, you know, I had a couple of things going for me, you know, way, way back in the day. Uh, number one, I had a burning desire. And the way, the form that burning desire took, this is back in the 1970s, this goes back a while, uh, is that I was a bowler. And I didn't want to be just any sort of a bowler. I wanted to not only be a professional bowler, but, you know, to be able to make my living as a touring professional, which was a pretty tall order. So the burning desire, absolutely, not only was the entrance requirement there, but it's something that's continued absolutely to serve me. It's the entrance requirement, period. You want to go anywhere, you've got to have that burning desire. If you don't have it, you're going to stop. Mm-hmm. To, to make a long story short here, I discovered spiritual work, and when I did, it just began to truly resonate within me. But not just spiritual work. I mean, I wanted to, you know, I, I just got to the point to where I wanted to lift all of the veils. Mm-hmm. And even though that initially was uh, to help me to be a better bowler, 
by discovering ways, meditation, for example, to kind of calm myself down in pressure situations to enhance my ability to perform. It didn't take long before I started seeking spiritual work for its, for its own sake. And one thing just leads to another. You know, you've got that burning desire. You just want to know, well, where does it end? <laughs> it, it, I tell you what, you know, it, it hasn't ended yet. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I tell you, it makes life a lot of fun. And uh, if you want to know something badly enough, the great thing I've discovered is that uh, you don't even have to know what it is that you want to know. All you have to do is want it badly enough, and people will appear. <laughs> They'll give you exactly what you need, and that's exactly exactly what happened in my life and it really really began in the early 1990s uh Initially, I just I learned about the grays and the abductions and the you know all of that, right. uh, uh, and all of the ufologists and what their take on uh, oh, basically that you know not not just the ET equation but uh, the secret government and they're playing all of this and uh, one thing just kept leading to another one and uh, like I say it hasn't stopped. <laughs> Yeah, man, that's well said. You're you're right. There are so many different ways to get onto this road, but I'm always curious what breadcrumbs a person finds first because it's just interesting. But <laughs> the main reason we decided to talk today was to discuss this really expansive saga of humanity's history that you write about because yeah. if it's true, it could give us a whole lot of insight into the present situation on Earth and fill, us, fill in a lot of gaps where information just seems to be missing or suppressed. But it's a pretty epic story. I mean, where where do we start with this thing, Bob? Well, you, uh, I think you pretty much hit it uh, when you said that we can't really know where we are today or where we're going until or unless we know where we've been. And, you know, we have it, according to conventional wisdom anyway, that everything began about 3800 B.C. in Sumer and 500 years or so later in Egypt. And before that, there was nothing but hairy barbarians. And if that's true, uh, the problem with that is that there's just, a, there's just a lot of things that don't fit very well. And, uh, and of course, if it doesn't fit your agenda, you just kind of sweep it under the rug and pretend it's not there. You're probably, you probably had a few guests who've talked a bit about that, and uh, we could too, but uh, we want to we wanna get into this history thing a little bit. But to give you some sense of what I mean, uh, I will just submit right now that uh, our planet, Mother Earth here, has a history that goes back at least 500 million years. And, uh, and our history goes back a whole lot more than 6,000 years also. So we'll do our best to cover all of this. But let's just for a moment look at this 500 million year uh, history of, of, the, of the planet. Where uh, we live on a planet and for most, most of our history, that is Earth history, uh, there have been beings here who have come from who knows where. And combined with other beings from – could be coming from anywhere and create whole new life forms. That's the way it's done. ETs uh, getting together and creating a new life form. That's how we were created. We'll get into that. And uh, at the appropriate moment, they leave and usually they don't leave any trace behind them. But – we're talking about civilizations, probably most of whom are so far beyond where we are today that we can hardly even imagine. Uh, you're, you've probably seen a few Star Trek episodes, Greg. Is that, is that fair, to, fair to say? That is fair to say. Yeah, okay, good. I, I knew I couldn't go wrong there. It's a pretty good guess. Uh, in the original series, there was one, it, one episode, one of my favorites. It was called... Uh, the heck was it called? Uh, Errand of Mercy or something like that, uh, where the Enterprise went to a planet to uh, uh, to warn the inhabitants that uh, there was great danger facing them because the Klingons were about to come and take over. And of course, we all know how terrible the Klingons were, at least in the original series. And to compound the issue, the inhabitants of this planet 
just appeared to be completely stagnant for eons. They were living in the Dark Ages, in the Stone Age. They were going nowhere and doing it very fast. <laughs> so they had no, no outward means of protecting themselves. And that's why Kirk and Spock came to warn them. Well, to cut to the, to the quick here, in some of the closing scenes, what we discover is that the inhabitants of this planet were taking on humanoid, humanoid form only for the convenience of their guests. Their true form, as they showed us in the closing scenes, was they were beings of pure light. And uh, we began to understand what they meant when they assured Kirk and Spot that there was absolutely no problem, there wouldn't be a war, they wouldn't be enslaved or any of that, because these beings of pure light not only could do they could stop a war, that's child's play, from happening, but they could do absolutely anything that they wanted to. And to me, that so perfectly illustrates the most likely history of this earth that there have been beings probably on that level and who knows, maybe even beyond, beings of pure light who can do absolutely anything they want. And, uh, you know, uh, Kirk pretty much summed it up at the uh, closing scene when he said that, you know, those guys are about as far ahead of us as we are of the amoeba. And I'd say that that was pretty accurate. So... That's probably a bit closer to the truth of the true Earth history, but to cut it down to uh, cut it down to size just a little bit here, where we can maybe begin to get a grip on it, uh, there is a source of source of information that is uh, it's got some pretty pretty fantastic information. Uh, the oldest known records on the planet are records that are on clay tablets in a language called cuneiform and they have only been discovered i don't know in the last within the last couple hundred years or so uh <clears throat> i'm not a student of the bible but uh 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 You've probably, Babylon is one of the ancient cities that was mentioned in the Bible, and there were more. Uh, they were not discovered until roughly within the last couple hundred years or so. And this is where these clay roundish tablets in this language cuneiform were unearthed. And then, of course, you get people who are able to, uh, to read this cuneiform. One particular person who's able to do that is a man by the name of Zachariah Sitchin. He's not the only one, but he's the most well-known because he's written a number of books. And if you look at one book in particular, it's called The Twelfth Planet by Zachariah Sitchin. You begin to get a pretty interesting, uh, it's, uh, well, it's a pretty interesting picture of what most likely happened hundreds of thousands of years ago. Now, I think that that's probably a pretty good place to begin. Right, right. Um, <laughs> Stitchin's work is definitely interesting. Uh, that's where the Anunnaki mining gold story comes from as well go. as yeah yeah and that is a pretty intense story in your book you also talk about work that comes out of the flower of life book by mm -hmm. uh, druvalo melchizedek is that relate how is that related to stitchin's work or is it you who puts those things together well let's let's put those some of those pieces together here uh this whole business for me around Drunvalo began in June of 1992, and this is when I was first introduced to him. And uh, I, uh, I just kind of sat there in kind of awe and wonder, uh, going, thank you, universe. Uh, this is exactly what I, you talk about, your burning desire leading you to be in the right place at the right time. And I realized at that moment that this was exactly what I was looking for in the moment, and uh, I didn't want to stop there. In essence, I made the decision, I want to know what this guy knows. So uh, I started calling him up. He was available on Saturdays and started talking to him uh, every Saturday, basically, for, for as long as I could, uh, and, uh, and started putting together uh, some, of these, some of these pieces in a way that began to make sense to me. And during our conversations, he told me that uh, he uh, was no longer going to be giving his Flower of Life workshop, but he wanted to know if I was interested in coming to, excuse me, coming to him so I could be trained to give it. And uh, I think it maybe took me about two seconds to, to respond to that. So, so I did. 
and uh, for 20 plus years I've been actually giving this Flower of Life workshop so you know this what I'm telling you is, is, is right out of my workshop uh, this is all before the Flower of Life books were, were ever written my book came out I think five years before his books did and uh, so it, uh, it, it predates that uh, you mentioned also the spirit science I think uh, yeah that's that series yeah, uh, right. I've 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 looked at it once or twice, and from what I can tell, it's right out of the Flower of Life yeah. workshop and books. So you you put this all together, and this is this is really where this information is coming from. So we'll put in a couple of more pieces here. Actually, actually, Greg, it, uh, let's just hold that and and just lay down a little bit more detail on the Zachariah Sitchin work. Sure. And and then in just a few moments we'll come back and we'll we'll uh, add the input from an ascended master by the name of by the name of Thoth, and this is information that I got from got from Drunvalo. So Sitchin first, and then we'll talk about Thoth, and uh, then we will uh, do our best to put everything together here. So if we if we look at Zachariah Sitchin's work first uh we learn about the planet Nibiru and uh that's a name that's gotten out there pretty good certainly in ET and UFO circles mm-hmm. many people think that uh Nibiru is is visit is 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 very near earth at this point and i have no idea if that's true or not what we do know according to the records is that Nibiru is a planet Actually, in our solar system, even though it's kind of weird, you know, relative to the to the other nine planets mm-hmm. or eight planets, depending on what you think about Pluto, but uh, Nibiru has a huge elongated elliptical orbit. It takes about 3,600 years for it to complete one orbit. And for most of that time, it is way, way out there, way beyond the the furthest planets in our solar system. But it does come in. And when it does come in to the inner solar system, it cuts in between the orbit of uh, between Jupiter and Mars. But uh, that's close. And uh, when it does come in, it's a major event in the in the solar system. But anyway, what the Sumerian records tell us is that uh, beginning maybe about 450,000 years ago, the inhabitants of Nibiru, called the Nephilim, the Anunnaki if you prefer, they were having a problem in their upper atmosphere. For them, it is a very serious problem because they need a greenhouse effect in order to keep the, the heat in. And so uh, they decided that they were going to suspend gold dust particles in the upper atmosphere. And after they had checked out all of the planets, they discovered that Earth was the best source of gold in the solar system. So they came here to mine gold. Now, these guys did have space travel, Mm -hmm. obviously, but it wasn't very (laughs) – it wasn't probably much more advanced than what we have today because uh, they uh, couldn't just take off any old time. They had to wait until Nibiru got into the inner portion of the solar system before they could even catch the ride to Earth, which meant that, you know, they sometimes had to wait as much as 3,600 years. But evidently, that was no problem because these guys, uh, a couple... (laughs) For a couple of things about them. First of all, they are just a bit taller than we are. They are between 10 and 16 feet tall. No kidding. Again, I'm not a student of the Bible, but the Bible does say there were giants on the earth back in the day. And that is quite true if we're to believe this information. But in addition to being giants relative to us, they also had a slightly longer lifespan. Uh try 360,000 years. (laughs) So uh, these guys came here to mine gold and uh, they brought roughly a thousand people, maybe a little bit less with them. Uh, Twelve of them were what we would call kind of like the bosses of the operation. About 600 of them were the gold miners and about 300 of them or so stayed up on the ship to uh, deal with operations up there. 
And for 100, 150,000 years or so, these guys were digging and mining gold here in, in southern Africa. But after a while, they got tired. You probably would too after, who knows, 100 plus thousand years of mining <laughs> gold. And they decided that, hey, uh, you know, uh, I don't, we don't want to do this anymore. So what they decided to do was to create a subservient race and the purpose of that subservient race, a slave race, would be to do the gold mining for them. Well, guess what? That slave race turned out to be us. So, <laughs> uh, Bad luck. This is right in the records. <laughs> and uh, you, you, have to, you, you have to wonder a couple of things here. The first is that if you want to get as close as you possibly can to the truth – you got to go to the oldest source, and we're talking about the oldest known records on planet Earth. So this is it. This is the this is this is what's available to us. Right. And this, the next question you might ask would be, well, would these guys have any reason to lie? And you got to wonder, well, what for? So you know, there's a pretty good probability that they were just giving straight and factual information as as they knew it. And uh, they talk about creating a subservient race to do their gold mining for them, and uh, that race turned out to be us. So what they did, the Nephilim, and, uh, and um, they took uh, clay from the earth, they took uh, blood from one of the primates, and they took sperm from the Nephilim, and they combined it together in their flasks and, uh, and uh, began the process of creating a new race. But this is where Thoth comes in. So we've talked about the Nephilim and their role in all of this. And uh, you're right, we do need to bring Thoth into the picture. And uh, because he's got information that, number one, fits perfectly – it's just almost too good to be true or a coincidence. So uh, you put the two together and you start getting, if nothing else, a very interesting picture of what very likely happened. And uh, uh, maybe it didn't, you know, uh, who knows for sure. But right. at the very least, at the very least, it sure is fun to talk about <laughs> and sure gives you at least an expanded possibility of uh, what what may have happened. I'd agree uh, with that. A lot more inter interesting than considering that everything began 6,000 years ago, which just doesn't make sense at all. Um, you know, I, I, I just have a wild idea, Greg. Uh, this 6,000-year uh, beginning of everything, uh, would it be okay if we just uh, take a moment here and, and, and talk about that for, for a little bit? I mean, some of the stuff that doesn't fit is, uh, you know, it, uh, it's, uh, if, if, you're, if you subscribe to everything beginning 3800 BC and nothing before that but hairy barbarians, there's just so many things that you don't know what to do with it. It's just so you ignore them. And, right. Uh, and we're really good at doing that. But uh, I think that that would be useful to, to just throw a couple things in there and just add that, add that to the mix. Absolutely. We love to poke holes in the official story. It's definitely a staple of what we do. So by all means, yeah, this 6,000-year-old version of conventional history has a lot of flaws. Let's point some of those out, Bob. Yeah, let's do that, as if you'd say no. <laughs> all right. So... Uh, uh, one uh, fun place to look at is the Giza Plateau. Uh, number one, if you take a look on the Giza Plateau at, at the Great Pyramid and all the stories of, you know, who created it, Kofu or Cheops or I don't know, because I don't pay any attention to that and slaves and ramps and all the rest of that. Uh, the precision of the, that Great Pyramid is such that it we don't have the technology to, to create a pyramid probably one-third the size of that today. So if we can't create even a miniature model of that today, 
you tell me how the heck slaves and ramps and whatever are going to create it a few thousand years ago. Right. Yeah, right. So uh, good luck on that one. Uh, talking about Thoth, who we kind of will uh, throw into the mix here, Thoth, this ascended master, this higher dimensional master, six dimensional consciousness, says that he is the person who built the Great Pyramid along with two of his ascended master buddies, a man by the name of Ra, another by the name of Ara Aragat. It was done on the fourth dimensional level. He said it happened the entire construction in a period of three days, and furthermore, that it was built from the top down. And uh, you can say, well, sure, you know, you know, tell me something else, but uh, uh, I'll come back and say, all right, that pyramid is accurate. You, it's, it's accurate down to a single atom. It is absolutely, completely flawless. Right. And, uh, and um, if he says he did it, I kind of tend to agree. And by the way, you can check this out. Uh, when he was uh, known as Hermes of Greece a couple thousand years ago, same guy, Hermes of Greece and Thoth, the, the, uh, and in fact, he goes way back to the days of Atlantis when he was known as Chikutet Arlej Vomerites. So the guy has been around the block a few times. But as Hermes of Greece, 2,000 years ago, he wrote this document called the Emerald Tablets, and he talks about a lot of this stuff in here. So you can get a sense of who this guy was and who he is, because he's still alive today. Would you say, that? see, that might be a little odd for people. Would you say he's, um, as he's gotten his names through different cultures and still exists today, is he more of a, just a spiritual entity? He is an archetype. He most likely is hanging out with the other ascended masters. There's about seven or eight thousand of them, and to demystify it as best we can, Greg, they're they're just like you and I. They simply have evolved to the point to where they are a much greater expression of their true nature. They've lifted enough veils, if you will, uh, including the uh, the whole veil of uh, how do you keep a body alive for fifty or hundred thousand years or whatever the case might be. Well, the answer is you discover that you either go through ascension or through resurrection, and either way, you step into and become an immortal being. Now, their consciousness is residing, for the most part, on a much, much higher level of awareness, six-dimensional consciousness, uh, compared to us way down here in the third dimension. Yet, they could come and grab a body and step into it and walk around probably any time they want, and allegedly, uh, a number of them have done that, Thoth being one of them, who stayed in his body for much of the time, over 52,000 years, and St. Germain, probably the best known of the other ascended masters, who allegedly comes and grabs a body and participates on a regular basis in our, in our evolutionary uh, cycle. So, um, <clears throat> So, um, um, it's, you know, it's just a fascinating topic in its own right. It is. But, uh, yeah, these guys are, when you're a six-dimensional being, you probably don't have a body on that level. If anything, you would be just a ball of light, <laughs> kind of like the Star Trek story. Right, or the orbs people see. Yeah. People see orbs of light. Yeah, they do, for sure. So, so we've got that, and... Uh, and let's stay at the Giza Plateau for just a moment uh, and take a look at the Sphinx. Because a number of people have, and if you go back to the 1960s, there was a man by the name of Schwaller de Lubitz who looked at the Sphinx and he kind of goes, well, you know, the wear patterns here, uh, being that they're 12 feet deep in some areas in the back of the Sphinx, sure looked to him like it was a lot more the result of water erosion rather than sand and wind. But uh, uh, there wasn't much he could do about that because everybody, you know, all the Egyptologists said, oh, this is, you know, this guy's nuts. Who's he? But in the 1970s, a man by the name of John Anthony West said the same thing, and he took it a step or two further because he brought in an American geologist, a guy by the name of Dr. Robert Schock, and Robert Schock showed conclusively, there's no doubt about it, that the wear patterns are definitely the result of water and not sand. But uh, the fact is that the Sahara Desert is somewhere between maybe 7,000 to 9,000 years old, and uh, 
if the Sphinx is more than 6,000 years old, the question is who built it? And of course, we can't go there, so we can't, uh, we just kind of sweep that under the rug. But uh, it certainly did stir things up when Robert Schock showed conclusively that this is water erosion. And furthermore, what he showed is that in order for the wear patterns to be as they are, there needed to be an absolute minimum of nonstop torrential rains for at least a thousand years, which is not likely. But that's all you need to push it over the, what, 6,000 year range. Uh, we're talking minimally eight to 10,000 years that right. Sphinx has to be. So, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big lump in the rug. <laughs> but there's, you know, we could go on and on with this. Uh, actually, I'm just, just beginning. Uh, you can look at the, uh, the Nazca lines in Peru. They can only fully be seen from the air. And one of my favorites is a E.T. with a big smile on his face, and he's kind of waving at us. And, you know, uh, hairy barbarians, man, those guys had more on the ball than we've given them credit for if they're the ones who did it. Uh, okay. Right. There are so many flaws in that official story. Yeah. Um, it, it begs one to wonder, you know, what really did happen. Yeah, it sure does. Well, let's talk about ETs because you have to include them in, in the mix. And uh, you uh, you like to get a little controversial on, on your show, I Love it. suspect. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you, you got to kind of wonder, is this, uh, what's, what's the deal here? There have to be people who know that our history goes beyond 6,000 years. Are they trying to hide it from us? Uh, is it possible that the global elite in the, in the sake, uh, <clears throat> in the attempt to uh, uh, preserve their dominance over us, uh, are doing everything they can to hoard the truth and keep it to themselves and to keep the masses in ignorance? So... Um, I would say so. <laughs> yeah, that's a good possibility there for sure. So, okay, uh, let's go back and talk about Thoth a little bit here and, uh, and uh, see what he has to say. I guess a good starting point is that uh, according to Thoth, if you're going to create a new race, and again, I would assert that this is done all the time. This is not... This is not only how we were created, but who knows, countless other races here on Mother Earth, planet Earth, have been created in a very similar manner by ETs. Mm -hmm. And so he says that if you're going to create a new race, that's fine. However, you have to have uh, the uh, – you have to have a mother and a father. I mean, it's pretty simple stuff. And uh, – the Nephilim would be our mother aspect, and according to Thoth, the father aspect has got to come from outside the system, meaning outside the solar system. Hmm. And so, where they came from is the third planet out from Sirius B, which happens to be a binary star system. That's, I think, pretty well gotten out there by now. There is a uh, third planet out, Sirius B, that is uh, mostly a water planet. Uh, the life forms on s third planet out, Sirius B, are fourth dimensional for the most part. In fact, I think they're all fourth dimensional. Most of them are cetacean, which gives you some something <laughs> good to think about right there. Uh, maybe those dolphins and whales are just a little bit further ahead of the curve than we've given them credit for being. <laughs> And uh, there are humanoids, uh, but not very many. Now, these humanoids, again, are relative to us giants, 10 to 16 feet tall. So what Thoth said is that 32 of them, which comprised a married family, and I'm not going to go into the details on that, but it's, uh, it has to do with the binary star system and the age of the system and, you know, things like that that I'd, let's just I did want to elaborate just on the binary star system a minute because some people might not have be totally clear on that but as your book says in the 1970s it was discovered that instead of just the solar system revolving around the sun the sun is actually moving in a pattern too and it's almost like 
uh, in space. It's almost like circling a drain. These things are all spiraling in conjunction with Sirius A being making that the binary star system. And it also mirrors the pattern of the double helix DNA strand, which is really interesting if you're into the whole so, as above, so below idea. We could well, be <laughs> a little speck on a piece of DNA inside some other being. Speaking of as above, so below, it is Thoth who coined that phrase. And right. so, that's Greg, that's really what this is all about. As above, so below, so perfectly sums it up. Uh, the holographic nature of the reality, the holographic nature of this universe, that uh, the entire, <laughs> the, if we, we want to get carried away here for a moment, mm -hmm. uh, the entire universe is contained in every cell of your body, if uh, you want to explore that for a bit. Uh, uh, as above, so below. It's all holographic. Right. But uh, what you said is true. And we perhaps should talk about the Dogons for just a moment to do it. kind of clear that for a moment. Uh, the Dogons are a tribe uh, in Africa, in Timbuktu. Yeah, there actually is a place called Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. And uh, for 700 years or so, They've got information uh, carved on their walls that uh, that really they just can't have. Uh, that is, if our version, our accepted version of history is, is accurate. Because uh, uh, the two just don't mix very well. Right. <laughs> they just don't mix at all. What? I think they say they, re they were here, they remember a time before the moon, as well as some of that information about Sirius A and B, correct? Um. About the time before the moon, I don't know about that. Hmm. Uh, if you do, please speak up. But, uh. <laughs> well, the internet is a vast place, but I've read on several websites that some early explorer who had met the Dogon and learned about or had gotten the information that they seemed to carry, one of those bullet points was that they seem to remember they have, you know, an oral tradition spanning back generations and generations, and their great, 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 great grandfathers talked about uh, a time where there was no moon. So uh -huh. that's a really strange aspect. But if it doesn't fit in here, what's really important is their information about Sirius A and B, right? Yeah, but it's fun to talk about no moons too. And <laughs> It is. We've been doing that a lot lately. Have you been doing that on your show? Uh, quite a bit. Yeah, it's a weird oh. idea. But Yeah, great. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to check some of that out because uh, I am interested in that. But uh, yeah, you're right. We need to talk. Uh, we need to... <laughs> we can probably be a good idea to get back on the tra track here, but right. it's, it's, it is fun to take a tangent here and there, and you can certainly do that with, uh, <laughs> with the subject matter. But uh, given, I the, think given what, the story we're talking about, it is just that the more important point is that they could see Sirius A and B, I think. Ah, uh, you're trying to get me back on purpose here, all right, <laughs> I'll go along. Yeah, they knew that uh, that Sirius was a binary star system, I think, as far back as 700 years ago, and we certainly didn't. I mean, you can't see Sirius B as just a dwarf. Uh, uh, but uh, they even said that the uh, Sirius B rotated around Sirius, e, Sirius A, the star that we do see, the brightest star in the night sky, about every 50 years. Now, that's pretty precise information. And then to get to your point, they also had a drawing of the relationship between Sirius A and Sirius B uh, from the period, I believe, of from 1912 to 1990. And it corresponded exactly to uh, what, what was it? Was it NASA that discovered that? Uh, anyway, what we're talking about here between 1912 and 1990 is the, uh, the uh, relationship you know, Sirius B revolving around Sirius A. And as you mentioned, it's looking like the DNA. And uh, 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 But uh, this is pretty precise information for a so-called backward tribe to have, and furthermore, to have had this information for 700 years or so. And so they were finally asked, well, where did you guys get this stuff? And uh, what they said is that, well, a ship came out of the sky and it landed, and uh, these creatures who looked a whole lot like do dolphins got out, dug a hole and filled it with water, started swimming around, and just gave them all of this information. Wow. Talk about something that doesn't fit. So that uh, 
pretty well got swept under the rug. But uh, this is a man by the name of Robert Temple who wrote the book called The Serious Mystery. So for people who really want to check that out, you might, might want to check out Robert Temple's book. Now, where were we before the tangent, before the last tangent? And uh, <laughs> talking about Thoth, and uh, yeah, 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 uh-huh, that the Syrians uh, became our father aspect, coming from outside of the system, and 32 of them, who actually were a married family, 16 males and 16 females, came here. They seem to know exactly what was happening. Now, again, these are fourth dimensional beings. So, you know, they're just a cut of two above us in terms of their awareness. Mm -hmm. And what they did is that they went into a dimensional warp inside the earth called the Halls of Amente. Right. It's kind of, it's really what it is. It's kind of, it's a fourth dimensional space. It's really the womb of the earth. And they went there and they, uh, they, uh, uh, with thought alone, fourth dimensional beings, just instantly created 32 rose quartz tablets and they just uh, lied down on them uh, in a perfect circle and uh, stayed there motionless for 2,000 years. And that 2,000 years was the conception process. So I'm leaving out some details here, but we kind of kind of have to if we're going to. Yeah, this gonna, is moving gonna along. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting there. Well, already a third of the way. Yeah, all right. Well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, they, uh, after 2,000 years, uh, we, Homo sapiens, started, started coming out. And uh, we were originally placed on an island off the coast of Western Africa, an island known as Gondwanaland. And, uh, and, uh, then we were taken to southern Africa because our job was to mine gold. And we did it for a long, long time. Now, a couple of things about uh, uh, us in our um, early days. And the first thing we need to know is that we were sterile. We could not have babies. And that was intentional because the Nephilim wanted to be able to control us. So... Uh, but they, uh, even though the mines were in southern Africa, for the most part were hanging out in the area that is now known as southern Iraq. They had their cities and their gardens and whatever there. And uh, this is straight out of the records that uh, in the uh, area in southern Iraq and their cities, uh, mentioning their gardens also, uh, this is where... Uh, and and the woman's name is Eve. I'm not making this up. This is right out of the records. Uh, was told that uh, if she ate the fruit of a certain tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that uh, she not only would gain the knowledge of duality, but also would gain the knowledge of how to procreate, of how to have babies. Now, originally, we were not supposed to go there. We were not supposed to do that. But according to the records, uh, one of the bosses, a guy by the name of Enlil, he was, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, Enlil, was one of the 12 bosses of the original um, Anunnaki. And uh, his brother um, is the one who told Eve that uh, she could go eat of this forbidden fruit. Well, what that did then is that kind of split us in two. There was a portion of us that was able to have babies, and the rest of us who remain gold miners were not. Mm -hmm. So what happened then is that uh, there, oh, I think about 60 or 70,000 years after the... Uh, original appearance as gold miners, the island of Ghanawanaland sank. Uh, there was a shifting of the poles and uh, shifting of the consciousness usually goes with it at the same time. And uh, so Ghanawanaland was no more. And I don't know what happened to those of us who were on Ghana land probably just moved to Africa closer to the gold mines because that portion of us did continue to mine the gold. However, 
the aspect of us that was now able to procreate was taken to a new continent that rose at the same time that Gondwana land sank, and that's the island continent that in the Pacific we know as Lemuria. And nice. so we went to Lemuria. And uh, things were evolving. Things were evolving quite nicely, actually. We were very young, but we were given our freedom, so to speak. Uh, those of us who still were minors were not given our freedom, but the people on Lemuria were. So we were allowed to do it on our own. We were young, we were feminine, we were intuitive. And what I mean by that is that when a new race of beings hits the, in this case, the earth, uh, they have to make a decision. And the basic decision is how are we going to perceive this reality? Are we going to, in essence, do it through our left brain, logical side, or are we going to do it through our right brain, intuitive, feminine side? We chose the right brain. And so what that meant, Greg, is that we were very much in harmony, very much in tune with our environment, very different <laughs> from the way we are today because we're very much, very much left brain culture. And uh, that's a big, big difference. Uh, here we are as a left brain culture today, we're standing apart from our from our world and trying to conquer it and control it. And just by the way, we're destroying our planet as a result of all of that. But when you're in harmony, uh, you, don't, you don't do those things. And furthermore, you have access to technology that can do anything our left brain stuff can do right now, but it does it in a much nicer and in a much cleaner way. You have to link with the technology, and when you do, you can perform what to us would seem like magic. Yes. Uh, dowsing this rod might be a good example. Right. And this is the area that I think is most fascinating, where the saga gets into Lemuria and Atlantis, as well as the Lucifer Rebellion. Yeah. That is uh, really what I want to try to get into, because we are at about the halfway point, and time just is flying. But I'll let you pick it back up with, mm -hmm. you know, we got to Lemuria. We obviously had this way of thinking that's far different than the way we're trying to do it today. And our technology, as you mentioned, I guess it's more of a of an internal driven technology versus today where it's all external. That's right. That's right. So um, internal meaning that you had to flip, you had to link with it. And furthermore, in the process of doing so, you can eventually get to the point to where you can learn by linking with this right brain technology how to do this for yourself. And in fact, that's where the most advanced races throughout the cosmos are today. The beings of pure light that we talked about on Star Trek, for example, could do anything they wanted, and they don't need anything outside themselves, no technology, no nothing. And uh, that, as far as I can tell, is real stuff mm -hmm. when you're you know, speaking of fourth dimensional and higher beings. So the link is, is to take the road of the right brain not the road of the left brain as we're doing, because we become dependent on our left brain technology. You know, the cell phone is a perfect example. Not that long ago, no such thing. Now, people are totally addicted to them. Like, how could you possibly live without it? Exactly. So We did qu quite well. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, that's what I'm curious about. Where in the this, in this story of humanity did that switch? Yeah, good. Well, we need to lay a little bit more groundwork here in order to let the uh, bigger picture begin to emerge. Sure. And, uh, and that is to talk about uh, the different levels of consciousness that are associated here with planet Earth. Uh, and who knows, maybe throughout the entire cosmos. But uh, even though there's five levels, there's three that are particular concern to us. There's a height range, number of chromosomes, and a totally different way of interpreting the reality depending on what level you are on. Hmm. 
So when we were in Lemuria and also in Atlantis, we were first level of consciousness. We were shorter. We were maybe four to five and a half feet tall. We had fewer chromosomes, 42 plus two, and we were in unity consciousness, not only right brain technology, uh, but the first level of consciousness is very much in harmony. It is a unity consciousness. Mm -hmm very much in harmony with its environment. So life was good in Lemuria. We weren't busy destroying ourselves. Now, the second level of consciousness is us. We're taller. We're about five to seven feet tall. We've got more chromosomes, 44 plus two, and we are disharmonic. And of course, we're virtually totally left brain also. The third level of consciousness relative to us are giants, uh, our mother and father aspect, 10 to 16 feet tall, so they are third level of consciousness. They've got more chromosomes, 46 plus 2, and they are a higher level of unity consciousness than even the first level. So, so we were the first level of consciousness. We were intuitive. We were right brain and very much in harmony with things. Mm -hmm. And uh, we knew, for example, that Lemuria was probably slowly sinking from day one. But when you're in harmony, it's not a problem. And eventually it did sink after 60 or 70,000 years. But when it did, I'm sure it was inconvenient, but not that big a deal because we were prepared. And we migrated to the west coast of the Americas. However... Back to Lemuria. It hasn't sunk yet. Uh, there's a little bit of information that we kind of need to focus on, and that is that uh, there was a couple in Lemuria by the name of I and Taye, and they discovered how to become immortal. And you're wow. talking about beings that are still alive today. And so they were some of the original ascended masters. But what they discovered is that by having a baby in a different way, uh, call it interdimensional mating, uh, not physically, they didn't even have to physically be in the same room. And I can't give you the details on how they did it, but somehow they did. And in the course of so doing, they, along with the offspring, uh, just kept on living. They became immortal. With, without a physical body, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, they didn't... It, it was not physical mating. You know, they could be on different sides of, of, of the continent and, and, and produce this, this infant. So they produced an infant on the astral plane, just so the audience is clear about what we're talking about. But in a real body. I mean, you're talking about real people in real bodies. Huh. Uh -huh. See, that's the part that I guess is, was unclear to me. Are these some of these eternal beings in physical bodies on the Earth today? Anytime they want. Ah, so they can go in and out. That's right, okay. that's right. When you get to the fifth dimension or higher, you don't need a body anymore. You're just a being of pure light at that point. However, you can come back anytime you want. The door swings both ways. And if you come back down to the third dimensional level, you can grab a third dimensional body, come out looking exactly like one of us. Nobody would know the difference unless probably you told them. And uh, you could... Uh, play the game of life on the third dimensional level for as, for as long as you wanted. And any time you wanted, you could also uh, uh, turn your body into a ball of light, leave this third dimensional reality, change your conscious wavelength, and uh, reappear on the fourth, fifth, or sixth dimensional level wherever, wherever you want to go. Hmm. So um, it's just... Uh, Kind of like the expanded opportunities that are that become available to you once you discover some of the you know <laughs> once you lift a few veils and 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 start getting uh, awareness of your true nature. Mm -hmm. You and I have the same capabilities. Uh, it's just that we uh, haven't quite gotten there yet. But <laughs> uh, it's, it's it's real stuff. Yeah. So, okay, so to get back on track, I guess, Lumeria was starting to sink. 
Yeah, and I and Taiye, these immortal beings, opening up a school, a mystery school called the Nikal Mystery School, and the purpose of that school was to teach what they had learned, to teach immortality to any and others who were willing and interested, and in the course of about a thousand years, they got about a thousand graduates. Uh, 999 would be perhaps a more accurate number because they uh, not only the mother and father stepped into mortality, but also the child. So in threeness, they stepped into immortality and they became the original ascended masters. But uh, eventually then uh, they uh, had to move on because Lemuria did sink and move on they did. Even though the Lemurians moved to the west coast of the Americas, the Ascended Masters, who were also known as the Nikals, uh, went to a new landmass that rose at the same time that Lemuria sank. Again, there was another shifting of the poles. Um, kind of just have to throw that out there without getting into why and how the poles shift, but uh, evidently uh, the shifting of the poles is something that happens on a fairly, if not very regular basis. Roughly once every 13,000 years or so, there's a very good probability that there will be a shifting of the poles, and that means entire continents can rise or sink, <laughs> and uh, it means that uh, very likely there will be also a corresponding shift in consciousness on the planet. And oftentimes, we literally shift dimensional levels. So... Um, this is um, this is good stuff. <laughs> yes, it is. All right. So the ascended masters, about a thousand of them from Lemuria, went to this newfound continent in the Atlantic, the continent that we know as Atlantis, and they set up right. they set up shop. But uh, they did not go to the main portion of the continent. Um, Atlantis uh, had a main, uh, the main landmass and, and some smaller islands surrounding it, maybe seven or eight or nine islands, some total. They went to a small island to the north, and according to um, the um, Emerald Tablets, they gave it a name, called it Undal, and, uh, and uh, um, oh boy. I don't know how much detail we can get into there, but uh, over the course of probably a few to quite a few thousand years, they they uh, at the time were six dimensional beings, and so they were able to do things that uh, you and I, yeah, we can't even dream of. <laughs> so let me just take a moment to kind of go into that. Sure. When they got to Undal, the first thing they did is they divided the island in half. They built a huge wall. I think it was 40 feet high and 20 feet wide. And half of the masters uh, lived on the left side. Half of the masters lived on the right side. The beings on the left side became the logical left brain thinkers. The ones on the right side became intuitive. Uh, and uh, they stayed that way. Uh, they further subdivided the island uh, uh, by building a wall uh, from east to west, so you've got four equal quadrants right now. What they were doing was duplicating the human brain, the way that we think. We have a left brain, logical side, we have a right brain, intuitive side. And even though the left brain is primarily logical, it does have an intuitive component to it. That would be the lower quadrant on the um, um, island here on Undal. And the same is true in reverse in, uh, on, the, on the right side. So even though the right side is primarily intuitive and feminine, it does have a logical uh, component to it. And to cut to the quick, this is what these guys were doing. They were duplicating the human brain finally to the point to where the thing became alive. <laughs> and uh, at that point, and this took a few thousand years, but at that point, they summoned the Lemurians from the west coast of the Americans to Atlantis. 
And because they were very intuitive, very much in tune with their reality, they didn't ask why or how or when, they just came. And they started creating eight major centers, eight major cities, if you will, on Atlantis. But um, To coincide with the nodes in the Tree of Life, if I'm not mistaken, right? Exactly, yeah. I wasn't going to go there because some people might wonder, well, what is the Tree of Life? It's a geometrical image, and uh, you know, we kind of have to have a visual to, to, to really be able to talk about that. Right. And we have gotten into sacred geometry a little bit before, so people are aware at least of the idea that there would be nodes on the planet or places where, you know, high-energy places on the planet, which are these eight places we're discussing that these beings have uh, kind of gone on the planet, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually there were two more there to correspond, as you say, to the ten points on the Tree of Life, but uh, two of them initially were left vacant. Uh, in essence, our awareness, our level of awareness had only evolved to the point to where uh, we, didn't, we didn't know how to fill in all ten uh, vacancies. We only were evolved enough to be able to fill in eight of them. Right. And I have to stop and wonder there for a moment, didn't these Nicole Mystery School members, the Ascended Masters, know that? Uh, because this is where some trouble, big time trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. This is my favorite yeah. part of the story. This is kind of oh, the, is. the meat that I wanted to tackle was what happened with these two, these two nodes. They apparently attracted some outsiders and that's kind of the the area that I think is most interesting that we don't hear about that much in this ancient history. Yeah, they not only apparently did, they definitely did. <laughs> and so uh, two ET races came in. The, uh, the first race, uh, and this is a big, big deal to understand because they were the Hebrews and they did come with permission. Now, that's, that's the important part right there as far as I'm concerned. Um, according to Thoth, uh, the Hebrews were, were a race of beings that in some ways were far more advanced than we were. But in other ways, uh, they uh, – well, he said they were like a kid who failed the grade. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they had to come back and repeat it. And uh, – and uh, reminds me in grade school, I, we, we actually did have one kid who had to come back and repeat the grade. And he wasn't a total dunce, you know. <laughs> he'd, he'd been there and done that. He retained some of it. So in some ways, they were more advanced than we were. But in other ways, they had screwed up horribly. Right. And, uh, Sounds and like so, the elite. Hey, right, it kind of does. So they had to come back. They had to come back to square one and, and just start over again. And, and, and they did. So they came back here and became uh, and merged with us. And uh, they were different, but they were not really a problem. The tenth group, this is the problem. This is a race of beings that came from Mars. Now, uh, it's not the Mars that we see today. It's the Mars, according to Thoth, of about a million years ago. And about a million years ago, Mars was a living planet. It was probably very similar to Earth, lakes and rivers and oceans and forests and, and, and the whole bit. However, the Martians were a race of beings who were virtually completely a left-brain culture. They had been around for a long time. We were still very young, still very right brain and intuitive, maybe the equivalent of a 12 to 14-year-old female. The Martians, on the other hand, were the equivalent of perhaps a 65 to 70-year-old male living and operating totally, 100% off of their left brain, which means they didn't have any emotions. They didn't have any feelings. They didn't have any compassion. And when you don't have any compassion, you've got no reason to care. And if you've got no reason to care, all there is for you is domination and control. And that's exactly what these guys were doing on Mars. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? You're in a constant state of war. <laughs> right. Well, eventually, you're going to blow your planet away. 
<laughs> war is not the solution to anything. Right, and that, as far as in terms of blowing the planet away, that's an interesting aspect when we were talking about the different types of the different ways to use technology, either by linking up internally with this type or by trying to externalize it. And that was kind of their thing, right? It was they were all about trying to externalize it into the physical world, and that's kind of where why it destroyed their physical world. There you go. If you don't have any compassion, if you don't have any emotions, you're you are you have severed yourself, you have cut yourself off from this reality. Because the way we link with this reality is through our feelings, through our senses. It's not, life is not a logical process. I mean, you know, just think about that for a moment. Uh, The moment you are conceptualizing, first of all, you are never ever in the present moment. It's not possible. The best you can do is conceptualize about what happened a moment or two ago, and what happened a moment or two ago is not what's happening right now. It is only a concept. And furthermore, when you're as left-brained as we are, you don't make distinctions like that. And so roughly, you're talking about the equivalent of when you don't distinguish between conceptual reality and experiential reality, uh, you're talking the equivalent of walking into the restaurant and eating the menu Mm -hmm. and wondering why it tastes kind of weird. So, you don't you cannot link you cannot link with the, with the greater truths you cannot uh create anything right brain because you've got no right brain to to link with mm-hmm. so the only thing that's available to you is left brain uh push a button type technology that you become totally dependent upon and totally addicted to right so let and, me a- well sorry but let me ask you this because I totally agree with that, and it seems like our planet, our scientific industries are totally fixated on logic only and weeding out the emotion. That is what the height of science is thought to be in our modern context, and this time when the Martians blew up their planet is considered to be called the Lucifer Rebellion, and I think there's a really stark parallel, and if you get into the secular nature of reality, we are talking the day after CERN is setting back up the Large Hadron Collider, trying to recreate the Big Bang or trying to open dimensions, and this to me really sounds like the Lucifer Rebellion. It sounds like externalizing all our technology, trying to do something that we shouldn't be doing, working with technology that's kind of outside of our means, and knowing that they're trying to recreate the Big Bang, to me that means reality could just disappear at any second, you know, if they if they were to achieve their goal. But it seems like there's some parallels there, wouldn't you say? Yeah, well, it leads to big time trouble, that's for sure. And uh, and when you're in a constant state of war, you're talking big time trouble for sure. So this is where these guys were at. And unfortunately, it's where we are still at today. And uh, we need to learn uh, if we <laughs> if we want to stick around for much for much longer that there's got to be a better way, and there is a better way. You've 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 you just have to find a way to harmonize with your, with your reality rather than continually standing apart from it, trying to conquer it and trying to control it. So right. uh, we need to learn. We need to learn quickly. And uh, uh, take a look at Fukushima if you want to. Uh, yeah, yeah, we are definitely. Good hard sure. lesson staring you in the face. Yep. Which, 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 by the way, is against all galactic law. Speaking of nuclear fission, uh, it's it's quite different from fusion, as I'm sure you know, because you know fusion's just fine. This is what the suns do. You're putting matter together, but when you start splitting it apart, you are violating galactic law on all levels, and we're beginning to find out just uh, what that's all about right now, because uh, it's uh, it's a big, big mess that you create when you go down this path of left brain culture, Lucifer rebellion, whatever you want to call it. Furthermore, there's this is this is the fourth time throughout you might say the history of the cosmos that this has happened. Every single time prior to now, it's led to nothing less than total disaster. Entire planets destroying themselves, which is exactly what happened on Mars a million years ago. They blew their atmosphere away. Uh, but just before they completely 
blew the atmosphere away. There was a small group of Martians that uh, got together in an area of Mars that we know as Sidonia. Uh, this is the area of Mars that has been brought forth primarily through the work of Richard Hoagland, you know, the face on Mars right. and the monuments, the different pyramidal structures and whatever on, uh, on Sidonia, and uh, all of which has geometrical uh, significance to it for sure that is telling you, uh, telling you, uh, it's telling you a lot. <laughs> but anyway, uh, back to this group of Martians, what they did in this area as of Sidonia is they built a time-space vehicle uh, through all the structures that they had created there. Uh, the face, the uh, pyramidal structures and whatever, all linked together in such a way that enabled them to create a vehicle that was able to travel through time, through space, and through the dimensional levels. and. That's what they used to get the heck off of Mars and to step into our culture, which would be about 935,000 years into their future, about 65,000 years into our past, this open vortex on the newfound continent of Atlantis. So they came, they came to Atlantis, and when they got here, they said, in essence, we're here, like it or not, and immediately... As a total left brain culture, you would expect they did what they know, and that is they tried to take control of Atlantis. So uh, they declared war right from day one. However, uh, they did not succeed in their attempted takeover. There were too few of them or whatever. And so, um, you know, you've got to pretty strange situation here. You got a 70-year-old man trying to understand and get along with a 14-year-old female. <laughs> and uh and it didn't work too well. Not unless you're in those pedophilia rings. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> which we aren't, but we know at the top of the pyramid, they definitely make the rounds. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They do. They do. And uh well, the Martians, in essence, raped us, is what they did, because even though they couldn't take over uh, uh, overtly, they eventually did covertly. And for 50,000 years, you're looking at really a bad marriage that, uh, that uh, uh, just didn't work very well. But behind the scenes, the Martians had just, you know, taken over. They took over the whatever was there, the banking, the government, the, you name it, they were controlling behind the scenes, mm -hmm. which as far as I can tell, if you want to know where the, where the secret government, the Illuminati actually came from, yes. what better place to look than to the Martians stepping into Atlantis? Total left brain culture, taking control of everything behind the scenes, kind of a familiar sounding story. Right. So, you've got for 50,000 years things not working as well as they, as certainly we would like, the Lemurian aspect of us. Um, about 16,000 years ago, there was a comet that was coming in, and uh, we in Atlantis had technology that was probably significant significantly more advanced than what we have today uh, based on crystals and uh, and not only could we track that comet coming in but we also had the technological ability to take that and blow that sucker out of the sky and that is exactly what the Martians argued for but the those of us from Lemuria uh, we were starting to feel our oats a little bit and not uh, not in ways that uh, the Martians exactly appreciated because we didn't appreciate their left brain technology and their covert attempts ongoing to keep us under their wraps. And so even though the Martians said, we need to blow that thing out of the sky, uh, the majority vote carried the day and, uh, and it was allowed to hit. I mean, a natural event, you know, let it hit. It's uh, <laughs> like that. Martians are saying, you guys are nuts. But it did hit. And 
the portion that hit Atlantis, most of it missed Atlantis, but the portion that did hit Atlantis, well, it's where the Martians were staying. A number of them were killed, and uh, to say the Martians were not pleased uh, is a slight um, understatement. <laughs> yeah, just just a little bit here. Uh, for the Martians, this was it. This was absolutely the last straw. And they just came out and said, look, uh, we're going to get a divorce. I don't. We don't care what you do. You go your way. We're going to go our way. And they did. They did. Which meant for them, they immediately tried to take control of Atlantis and ultimately the, the entire planet. Um, how did they try and do that? Well, by recreating the ancient experiment that got them here in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, it's what in the book, in my book, I talk about as a synthetic Merkaba. Uh, Merkaba is actually three words, Merkaba, which stands for counter rotating fields of light that takes both spirit and body with it. Now, if you are in harmony with life, uh, you uh, can eventually get to the point to where you can create this as a living energy field around your body. And this is one of the keys to immortality. This is how the Ascended Masters uh, back in the day discovered either ascension or, uh, or resurrection uh, by recognizing that they could take these living fields – around their bodies and uh, change their conscious wavelength. And in so doing, combined with making a 90 degree turn, could turn their bodies into a ball of light, disappear from this reality, from this dimensional world, and reappear in a different dimensional reality, in a different world, just as real there, bringing their body with them, just as real there as they were here. However, it has also been discovered that it could be created synthetically using only left brain logic. And this is the essence of the Lucifer Rebellion. Uh, the ultimate problem is that if you do it this way, you become a race of beings similar to the Martians, the Illuminati, uh, and the Greys are another really perfect example of a race of beings that has followed this to the nth degree, to the point to where they long ago have completely severed their emotional ties with this reality. And in so doing, they have literally stepped into and created a separate reality that functions only through logic if you've got no emotions, you're just cut off from that aspect of, of life. You can understand this reality. You can understand it logically perfectly. Uh, and you can create all the left brain technology you want. Some of it is pretty darn incredible, including synthetic Merkabas, which we usually refer to as UFOs. It's, that's what they are. They're synthetic Merkabas is, is, is what they are. And with them, you can travel. You can do your conscious wavelength change, travel through time, through space, through dimensional levels, and uh, do most anything that a living energy field, Merkaba field, would do. But there are some rather significant uh, limitations, mm -hmm. not the least of which is that you are living in a separate reality. You are living life conceptually. You are cut off from what's, what's really so in the... Um, in the universal scheme of things. Right. So you could say that basically any type of external technology is inferior to the internal. Kind of like if people are trying to make progress, a lot of times we'll have spiritual people talk about the internal path and always looking inside to fix things because you can't change your external world, but you can your internal so I think that's interesting because today in the modern world, if we're trying to determine where we're going, it seems like we're sacrificing the internal changes that we should be making for external solutions. Yeah, this might be kind of hard for some people to hear, but nonetheless, it is absolutely true. And I've been hanging out with this for 
20 or more years right now, and it just, it just keeps coming to me on deeper and deeper levels. What you said is absolutely true. You need to start looking inside. You need, I mean, the more you continue to look outside of yourself for solutions, the more you give your power away, the more you give your power away, the more you are separating yourself from the source, and the more confusing life becomes. And you become addicted to the technology, and you might be clever enough <laughs> in a fiendish way to fool yourself into thinking that, oh, man, you know, I've really, really got it handled now because I've created this technology that can do all these fantastic things. Mm-hmm. I mean, what could be better than getting in your UFO and buzzing around the cosmos? Yet, uh, you're missing the point mm-hmm. to a very, very significant degree. So, um, it's uh, just to kind of throw that out there. <laughs> I'm right. glad you did. So, yeah. But just to maintain good pacing, how do we get from Atlantis to Samaria? How do we bridge the gap between this very far out, very epic, ancient tale and the conventional history, which starts around Samaria? How do we get there? So let's have some more fun and talk about the uh, what happened in Atlantis and how that eventually led to the Sumerian culture appearing about uh, 6,000 years ago. So we've got the comet coming in and hitting, uh, hitting Mars and doing the damage to the Martians and the Martians saying that is it no more. We're going to go our separate way and we're going to take over Atlantis and we're eventually going to take over the take over the Earth. And they could have done exactly that if their experiment would have been successful. But it was 50,000 years or so uh, between experiments. And they probably thought they knew how to create this external Merkaba field, this synthetic field. But the moment they got that thing turned on and going, it immediately went out of control. And it's about the greatest disaster that you can imagine. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anything greater than a synthetic Merkaba field going out of control because this out-of-control field almost destroyed the Earth. Almost. It started ripping ripping open lower dimensional levels. Uh, Beings from uh, other aspects of the Earth all of a sudden found themselves in Atlantis. Uh, The place just went crazy. Now, the Ascended Masters, well, they didn't know what to do, but uh, they were wise enough to ask for help from higher forms, higher life forms, and they were given help. So, with the information that they were given from much higher life forms, Galactic Command and who knows who else, they were able to seal up most of the damage, probably 90 to 95 percent of it. Most of the damage, the dimensional tears and whatever were sealed, but not all of it. And for about two or 3,000 years, Atlantis just kept going further and further and further downhill. And it was becoming very, very obvious that at about... Well, this is 16,000 years ago that this happened. About 3,000 years into the future, 13,000 years ago from now, it was very clear to the Ascended Masters and to higher life forms that not only would we experience a pole shift, and we did. This is where Atlantis finally sank. But also, we would be, in essence, in free fall from a higher dimensional level down to a much lower dimensional level, Mm -hmm. the one we're at right now. So, at the time, we were in Atlantis on the fourth dimension. And so, in many ways, we were significantly more advanced than we are right now. We had an interpretation of that reality that you can't even begin to talk about on the third dimensional level. So, you know... Uh, in spite of the Martians, life was still good. Uh, that is until all um, all of this hell started breaking mm-hmm. loose. <clears throat> all right. So, um, thirteen thousand years ago, the poles were going to shift, and we were going to fall to a much lower dimensional level. All as the, part of the price that we paid for this 
incredible abuse of technology. Which the archaeological record kind of backs that up, that 13,000 years ago was a massive upheaval. Uh, That's for sure, the flood and all of that. About 200 years before the shifting of the poles, the shifting of the axis, uh, Thoth, along with Ra and Ara Aragat, two other ascended masters, uh, went to Egypt. And at the time, it wasn't a it wasn't a desert; it was a uh, tropical forest. And uh, they went to the Giza Plateau, and they went to a very specific spot there. They dug a hole about a mile deep and lined it with bricks. Now, just by thinking the thought, six dimensional beings, you don't need a shovel. You just think the thought. There's your hole, and here it is lined with bricks. The reason they did this is because there was an axis point coming out at this very point where they dug the hole, an axis point that served as the North Pole at the time for the grid that eventually would lead us into this higher level of unity consciousness, this third level of awareness that we briefly talked about a a while back. But uh, this grid was going to be destroyed 200 years into the future. It would not survive this dimensional freefall. Um, kind of need to explain that for just a little bit here. What I mean by a grid is that in order for a species to exist on our planet, there needs to be a corresponding electromagnetic energy field that encircles the entire globe. Uh, Usually it's about 60 miles above the Earth. It's electromagnetic in nature. It has very specific geometry associated with it, and it encircles the entire globe, and you cannot exist without it. So whether you are a frog or a dog or a cat or a human being, uh, you have to have a corresponding grid or an energy field in order for you to exist. Hmm. And you have to have, if you are a human being, given that we at the time were on the first level of consciousness, a grid or an energy field for that level, you also had to have a grid for the next step, the second level, which is where we're at today, and you also at the time had a energy field or a grid for the third level, Uh, because the Ascended Masters had, for the most part, stepped into this level, and this third level of higher level of unity consciousness, this grid was beginning to function, but it would not survive the dimensional freefall. Does that make enough sense? I would say so. I would say that's enough context. Okay, so let's let's continue then. Um, The reason they went to this point and dug this hole and aligned with this axis point is because this is consistent with what they were given from higher life forms. Um, Albert Einstein, good old Uncle Albert, uh, I like to quote him whenever I can. And uh, one of my favorite sayings is that uh, from Einstein is that you cannot solve your problems with the current level of awareness that created them. You got to find a way to step above and beyond it if you want to solve your problems, Mm -hmm. which makes perfect sense. So, what higher life forms in essence were giving us is that if you want to solve this really unsolvable unsolvable at our level of awareness problem of an out-of-control synthetic Merkaba field, you got to find a way to rise above it. And rising above it means that you have to, as a species, find a way to get to this third level of awareness, this higher level of unity consciousness. At that level of awareness, you can solve your problems probably as simply as just just by thinking the thought. Bingo. Mm -hmm. It's solved. But you have to have a grid that will enable you to get there. So... The Ascended Masters, namely Thoth, Ra, and Aran Aragat, were given this blueprint, if you will, that over the course of 13,000 years would enable them to synthetically reconstruct, recreate the grid for this level of unity consciousness that eventually would enable us to evolve into it, if all went well, and then once we're there, problem is solved. But you don't just step right into it. 
Not at all. First of all, you have to create the grid. It had to be synthetically created because it really was a matter of time more than anything. They knew, the ascended masters and the higher life forms knew that we only had about 13,000 years to get this all done. And if we didn't get it all done, uh, we probably weren't going to be around for much longer. Because in order to get from the first to the third level of consciousness, from the lower to the higher level of unity, now again, we were in the first level back in, 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 in Atlantis, we were in unity, but we had to get to the third level, is higher level of unity consciousness, but you can't just go from one to the other. You have to use this intermediate step called the second level of consciousness, the one that we're on right now, which is disharmonic. Yeah, life has never figured out how to go directly from the first to the third level without using the second disharmonic step as a stepping stone. The process began 13,200 years ago, and it swung... uh, um, into full force when they created the on the Giza Plateau, the Great Pyramid, and the other two pyramids. And like I said, Thoth says he did it three to three and a half days, and it was done from the top down uh, with the precision down to a single atom. And in other words, nothing at all was random about the Great Pyramid, including its location. Well, From this point where this hole was dug about a mile away from the Great Pyramid, there is spiraling energy that comes out and where it first hits the surface of the earth, this is where the Great Pyramid was built. Ultimately, these spiraling energies, there's a couple of them, spiral around the entire planet. And this is significant because the additional work that Thoth, Ra, and R.R. God did on the fourth dimensional level was to ultimately, fourth dimensionally, create 83,000 sites, PowerPoints, if you will, or sacred sites, if you will. Uh, Some of them were natural, built uh, with mountains uh, because of the PowerPoint aspect. Some of them were like temples and pyramids and whatever, and all exactly aligned to mathematically link back to the single spot back in Egypt. This was all done on a fourth dimensional level, and then over the course of 13,000 years, People were led, psychically, intuitively, if you will, to recreate these structures that already existed on the fourth dimensional level, to recreate them on the third dimensional level. So the Mayans, for example, in their construction of Chichen Itza, to be, give a very specific example, um, a third dimensional pyramid, uh, were intuitively guided the ascended masters were guiding them, essentially giving the blueprint. Will you please build this structure right here and exactly in this manner and the uh, pyramid that we know as Chichen Itza, to give an exact example. Hmm. Okay, so this is how over the course of 13,000 years, what already was created on the fourth dimensional level was slowly but surely recreated on the third dimensional level. Every single one of these buildings, these structures, these pyramids, these, these uh, churches, whatever, can be mathematically delineated back to the single spot in Egypt. And over the course of 13,000 years, what you're talking about here is major major geomancy, which in essence is uh, consciously, very consciously uh, manipulating energy on the surface of the earth in such a way that it has the effect of doing something very similar 60 miles above the earth. In other words, synthetically over the course of 13,000 years, creating this grid for this level of unity consciousness, 13, uh, excuse me, 60 miles above the planet. Hmm. So is that clear? Does that make sense? It is. And it's kind of interesting because I do have researchers come on the show and they talk about Earth as some type of cosmic prison planet. 
And we're kind of talking about lower dimensional beings being kind of stuck here. We're talking about we had once violated galactic law, which put us down on this third dimension. So it's kind of jiving with a lot of other material also. Yeah, all of that is true. We are quarantined. We've been in jail for 13,000 years. <laughs> and so uh, uh, on this second level of consciousness. So, all right. I'll just throw out one more little, I think, uh a useful tidbit of information. When I say that these 83,000 sacred sites can all be mathematically delineated back to the single spot in Egypt, there is a man by the name of Carl Monk who has done this, not with all 83,000 of them, but with, I don't know, somewhere between maybe 100 or 200, maybe as much as 250 of them or so. Uh, what this man, Carl Monk, has discovered is that there is a code on the uh, right on the outside. I mean, you can walk right up to it and read it if you know what you're looking for, I guess. If you're Carl Monk, anyway, you can. Mm -hmm. And uh, what he discovered is that, uh, that this code will give you the exact latitude and longitude relative to the single spot back in Egypt. So, I mean, that that kind of backs up what we're talking about here, that it's a single mind, it is a single consciousness that created all of these sites. Wow, I mean, yeah. If you can show, I think he's done it with about 100 of them, if you can show that at least 100 of them are not in any way an accident, but they all link back to the single spot back in Egypt, you got to say that that is some coincidence, <laughs> <laughs> maybe a little bit more. Than right. coincidence, yeah. I yeah. Um, when I first heard the story, I thought it was very far out because I don't experience a lot of energetic effects in my personal life. But um, I love to see other things come out and they kind of validate the story. Something like Carl yeah. Monk's work, you know, that would be uh, one example. But I do love to see that because it makes a story that seems really far fetched. It kind of brings it down to well, maybe it might be worth considering. <laughs> Yeah, it does kind of tax you a little bit, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I've got to say that for myself, at least, I just relied from day one when I first when I first started hearing about this. I just relied on my intuition, and it just kept giving me a strong yes. Mm -hmm. Keep going. There's something going on here. So I uh, I spared myself of trying to prove it logically, uh, but uh, I sure was glad to hear that Carl Monk has done a lot of the groundwork for us, and it just, I mean, these pieces just fit together so well that you kind of have to conclude that uh, there might be something going on here. Very, very much so. Yeah, yeah, now, all right. I know you do a lot of work, a lot of energetic work, and I'm curious for the skeptics that are out there, for the people in the audience who might be a little critical, who might have never experienced something <laughs> energetic, like myself, uh, I would love to be told what to do so where I could validate these things by saying, hey, you know, do X, Y, and Z, and you'll have a physical sensation. You'll be able to sense this energy field that apparently is there. Yeah. How can we sense it if it isn't innately apparent? Well, one of the keys is through your breath, and I've I've been teaching breath work for for a long, long time now, and uh, I can uh, you know if, if we were to take a little bit of time together, I could show you that you have so much power, so much energetic healing power contained in just your breath, that what I've discovered throughout the years is that contained, it, contained within you. And here again, this is a function of looking inside of yourself, not externally, not to doctors or to other so-called authority figures who don't heal you in the first place, that you have contained within you the ability to heal absolutely anything. I don't care what the condition might be, terminal cancer or AIDS or uh, whatever, uh, you can heal that uh, and including in a addiction to outside authority, you can heal that too. So that's just one example of, uh, of, of what you can discover as a result of going within you. And, uh, uh, you know, for a person who is skeptical, actually, I've got to put myself in that category too. I don't just blindly believe any and all of this, although it might sound that way. <laughs> well, you've had, you've had experiences that corroborate it for you. Yeah, exactly. I set out to uh, to do exactly that to whatever degree I can. So I'm not just, uh, 
you know, I'm not just a spiritual airhead here. In fact, quite to the contrary, I pride myself on being in the moment and being very grounded and in the moment. The only way you can truly and totally be in the moment is 100% to be in your body. That's what keeps you in the present moment. So I'm not, uh, according as I see it, an airhead at all. I'm practical and grounded. And uh, and just in case, I titled my book, Nothing in This Book is True, but it's exactly how things are. So, you know, it kind of gives me a little liberty to talk about <laughs> this stuff. It does. Yeah. Yeah, uh, let's tie some pieces together here. Let's see if we can establish now the link between the fall of Atlantis and the establishment of uh, of uh, Sumerian culture uh, a few thousand years into the in, into the future. So I think we've laid enough groundwork. Uh, we uh, we talked about then how thirteen thousand years later. This grid was established, and by the way, it's up there, it's alive, and it's well, and it's functioning, and it is the vehicle that will enable us at some point to move into this higher level of unity consciousness. And man, if we get to that point, life is really going to be fun, i got to tell you. <laughs> Because there's not too many veils left to lift at that point. Mm -hmm. You are aware at that point of your relationship between your thoughts and your feelings and how you are unerringly creating this reality uh, literally all the way out to the most distant stars. And uh, life has got to be, if it's not an exciting adventure now, uh, it certainly will be at that point. However, the best way to get from here to there is to enjoy the moment. It's the only way, in fact. So, be here now. That's the key. Now, um, how do we get from uh, how do we get from uh, Atlantis to Sumer? Well, all right. Uh, uh, Eventually, uh, 13,000 years ago, everything did fall apart. I mean, if you're an Atlantean at least. Atlantis sank, and uh, this happened in the space of about 20 hours, where no more Atlantis, it's at the bottom of the ocean. And furthermore, uh, we are in dimensional freefall. So what the Ascended Masters did, and by the way, there were about 1,600 of them by now, the original thousand and about 600 more who went through assess ascension in the time of Atlantis. What they did is they went to Thothron or Aragoth, that is, when the signal was very, the signs were very clear that uh, they needed to move into action because Atlantis was sinking. So what they did is they went back to the Giza Plateau, but this time they went to the Sphinx. And the reason they went to the Sphinx, and this is right in the Emerald Tablets, about a mile beneath the Sphinx is the oldest synthetic object on planet Earth. It's a spaceship. So what they did, they lifted it up simply by raising it an overtone higher, just by raising its vibration level. They lifted it up, got into it, flew back to Atlantis, picked up the 1600 Ascended Masters. Uh, they say, Thoth said they got no more than about a quarter mile off the ground, and uh, that's when the final portion of Atlantis sank into the ocean. So Atlantis is gone. The Ascended Masters now flew back to the Giza Plateau, and this time they flew back to the Great Pyramid. They landed on top of the Great Pyramid. It was intentionally constructed with a missing capstone, which would enable it to be a perfect landing platform for this circular ship. They landed on it, and when they did, uh, uh, we were in dimensional freefall. Now, this was not a positive free fall. This was from fourth dimension all the way down to the third dimension. And when that happens, when you either go up dimensionally speaking or down, either way, for usually three to three and a half days, you are in the void between dimensions. And when you're in the, when you're in the void, the earth as you know it will simply not be there. And, and back then, it was for three and a half days. In the void, you're no longer, no more planet Earth, absolute voidness, wow. total darkness, total nothingness for three and a half days. 
what enabled the 1600 masters to keep it together was their construction of a very powerful living group Merkaba field. If they didn't have that, we wouldn't be here. And if they didn't have that, uh, uh, their memories would have been completely erased. Because when you go into the null zone, when you go into the, devo- into the void between dimensions, if you don't have some sort of way of keeping your memory intact, either through a living energy field or a synthetic one called a Merkaba, your memory will be erased. Mm. Uh, and uh, there were survivors from Atlantis. And all but a small number of them had their memories completely erased. So, not only did they find themselves after three and a half days on a much, much lower, denser dimensional level than they had ever experienced, but they had no way of interpreting anything. If you've got no memory, I mean, you know, you could be sitting in front of your computer right now, but all of a sudden, if your memory is erased, (laughs) you would, yeah. All right, or reach into your into your pocket for your car keys, <laughs> not having the foggiest idea what they were, let alone what that thing parked outside your house is, <laughs> let alone how to get outside your house in the first place. You're back to square one, man. <laughs> That's figuring out how to figure what fire is and keep warm and, and, and all of that. So was it these few who did have their memories? Was it them who established Sumeria? Yeah, they did, for sure. But not in, not instantly. It took them about seven thousand years to do it. So after three and a half days of being in the void, when re, when the Earth finally did reappear on a much much lower dimensional level, here they are. They're parked on top of the Great Pyramid. So what they did is that they about a third of them. Uh, Ra took about a third of the masters uh, to an underground city that was constructed at the time the Great Pyramid was was built. And uh, eventually, they, well, they just sat there and waited. Probably their consciousness, their awareness was on the sixth dimensional, but they had those third dimensional bodies down in this underground city that they could come and, and grab anytime they wanted to. They eventually became known as the Tot Brotherhood. Right. Tot Brotherhood, uh, meaning that uh, uh, Thoth had a son by the name of Tot, who joined this group beneath the pyramid, and uh, they took his name eventually, the Tot Brotherhood. The inner circle was these roughly 500 plus ascended masters, these, these immortal beings. But they didn't stop there. They took the ship and they flew it to Lake Titicaca, landed it on the Island of the Sun, and this is where Thoth got off with about a third of the masters. And uh, and, uh, then they flew to the Himalayas, where the remaining masters, all but seven of them, got off. And uh, seven of them that stayed on the ship flew back to the Sphinx and uh, put the Sphinx back about a mile below the uh, the Sphinx, and it's stayed there for 13,000 years. Well, nothing these guys did was arbitrary. Uh, What they were doing was beginning the process, if you will, of reseeding the human race. So, starting at square one, you've you had, in addition to the masters, there was a small group that we know as the Mayans who evidently were able to keep their memories intact. And the only way they could have done that was through a living Merkaba field. So they resettled in, 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 um, in Guatemala, in the Yucatan, and uh, they linked up with uh, Thoth uh, in the... Uh, in the uh, Island of the Sun, in in, um, Lake Titicaca area. Well, very patiently, this seed group waited for about 7,000 years. Uh, They had to wait for at least that long before the survivors of Atlantis could even evolve to the point to where they could even begin to absorb the lost information of Atlantis. But when it was finally thought that they, that it was okay to proceed, let's put it that way, the Tot Brotherhood, 
that had been patiently waiting underneath the Great Pyramid for about 7,000 years in combination with the Nephilim, our mother aspect, up in the area that uh, we now know as southern Iraq. Essentially what they did is they just came out and started giving back the lost information of Atlantis to the people that were there. Mm -hmm. So, in, uh, in Egypt, you've got the Tot Brotherhood, and they would come out in small groups, two or three at a time, and they were dressed exactly like the Egyptians of the day, and they would just walk up to a group of the people and say, uh, you know, did you know that if you did X, Y, and Z, that you can create this really neat thing? be it a dam or a boat or whatever it might be. And so they just gave them this information and then went back under the Great Pyramid and patiently waited for this to take root, for this to evolve. And uh, all of a sudden, the Egyptians became uh, very proficient in one particular area of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So the Tot Brotherhood came out and did the same thing, kept doing it over and over and over. And in this way, they were reseeding the race. And in southern Iraq, the Nephilim were doing the same thing. And this is what led to the Sumerian culture. And this is also what led to the Egyptian culture. Now, even though our history tells us that they were about 500 years apart, that the Sumerians came first in about 3800 BC and roughly 500 years later, the Egyptian culture came out. It's far more likely that the two came out at roughly the same time, if not exactly the same time. Hmm. Because the far more likely scenario is that the, uh, the two got together, the Tot Brotherhood along with the Nephilim, and just decided, okay, it's now or never. Let's see what we can do here. And actually, they did a great job because these two cultures came out uh, in their fullest and most developed form, just literally out of nowhere. And uh, I mean, this is rather strange indeed. Right. You know, it's not the way it's usually done. It would usually be done through a slow period of evolution and one thing leading to another. Uh, but this is not the way these two cultures came out. I mean, you know, you're talking essentially the equivalent of, you know, who was who it that uh, – when was the automobile invented back in the early 1900s? It's just like if a, a modern-day automobile would appear in 1900 with nothing before it. I right. mean, for how for and, and how could this possibly be? But it does jive with the mystery of why the culture sprung up overnight. And the idea of superior beings living under the surface or being under the surface and coming out, that's a theme that comes up a lot, whether it's mythology or the lore of Ireland or, or this story. So uh, it seems it has to be rooted in something. Yeah, it's called stair step evolution, and not many people can logically explain how it could be. Sitchin has a good idea because he's able to interpret these uh, Sumerian records, the cuneiform uh, clay tablets. And uh, uh, if you can accept even a portion of what we're talking about today, then you can put these two pieces together from what Thoth is telling us in combination with what the Sumerian records are telling us. And you can kind of glean that, my gosh, maybe the uh, Tot Brotherhood actually did uh, uh, have a significant hand in the creation of the Egyptian culture and the Nephilim doing a similar thing with the creation of the Sumerian culture. Well, uh, uh, nonetheless, this appears to be what happened, and nobody can explain it unless you uh, go as far out on the limb as we have and uh, have a little fun doing it. So, uh, well, I was just, I, th I do think that that all makes sense, and it seems like in the ancient sense of secret societies and, and brotherhoods, they seem to be overwhelmingly positive, but yet we do have the Illuminati or the, the elite of today. Where do we see them springing into the story? Well, there's one more piece of the puzzle we have to put together here before we can, before we can go there, and that is uh, uh, the introduction of writing. It is Thoth who introduced writing in the early days of Egypt, and he did it because he had to. 
He had to do it because he knew that that would be the very thing that would take us away from the dream time memory that we had on the first level of awareness. And I'll briefly explain that. Back on the in the day of Atlantis and prior to that in Lemuria, we were again on the first level of consciousness. We had a not only a totally different way of interpreting the reality, but also of accessing memory through what you might call a holographic memory. We had the ability to holographically recreate an event in case you wanted to tell your buddies what happened last week. Well, if you wanted to do that, you could holographically recreate the event be it in a building, in a house, or whatever, everyone and everything in it, invite your bodies into that hologram, and in that way, you could show them with 100% recall exactly what happened. Evidently, we had that kind of memory, that kind of access to, to memory, but uh, that was not... Uh, not allowed to proceed because here again, Thoth had to introduce uh, a way of getting us from the first level into the second level in order to give us this stepping stone to eventually get us into this third level, this higher level of unity consciousness. You can't go directly from the first to the third. He knew that by the introduction of writing, that would be the very thing that would throw us out of this holographic memory into uh, basically a state of amnesia, which is uh, where we're at today. And uh, it was done because it was absolutely necessary as the catalyst, if you will, to throw us from the first level into the second level of consciousness, the level that we're at right now, all in preparation for getting us into this third level of unity consciousness. Hmm. Okay, does that, does that make sense? And does that kind of complete the circle for you to where we were as opposed to where we are and hopefully give us some reference to where we're going? Uh, it does. And I guess by introducing writing, creating, it almost seems like a negative thing, mm -hmm. but that's just because it's that's what facilitates an evolution. Yeah, and it was absolutely necessary to kind of uh, throw us for a loop for a while, if you will, for about 6,000 6, years, mm -hmm. to throw us into a disharmonic consciousness, but it was all absolutely necessary. Because again, you must, if you want to go from the first to the third level, from the lower to the higher level of unity consciousness, you must use this stepping stone, this disharmonic step that we're on right now, called us the second level of consciousness. And uh, it's all designed in the larger scheme of things to eventually get us into this higher level of unity consciousness where we will be able to solve our environmental problems and all the rest of them, and uh, including all the um, <laughs> damage that the Illuminati has done. Because right. again, these guys are total left brain, total a total left brain culture, Martians to the nth degree, if you will, and uh, they don't know any better. They really don't. Yeah, it's it's interesting. So I guess even though we might think of someone doing what Thoth did as a as a negative thing, and we might see secret societies and initiatory orders or these people who are at the core, you think masonry is about uh, sacred geometry and these things. Mm -hmm. They're also controlling the planet, which seems to be going in a negative direction. Is this the reason for that? Well, what it all is is tools and information, and it's your consciousness that determines how you use it. And so, if you have an awareness that is basically, uh, well, when you're in unity consciousness, let's put it this way, individuality as we know it now, in, in essence, ceases to exist. You're no longer looking at out at a world that you don't get your connection to it, standing apart from trying to conquer and control it. You're much more like cells in the larger body, each cell contributing to the greater good of the whole. And this is, this is a, I think, a useful way of looking at the difference between separation consciousness and unity consciousness. But if you're talking about the global elite, 
people that are operating almost entirely off of their left brain, if you've got no intuitive capabilities, you've got no reason to care, you've got no reason to link together, you've got no reason to see this this uh, this uh, this reality as anything other than an us versus them type type thing. Mm-hmm. And so that's talking about domination and control. Right. What's in it for me? Who cares about you guys? Well, exactly. And it seems it seems odd or I can't rectify why these ascended masters would allow this information that kind of allows them to live a superior way, why they would allow this to get into the hands of people with dark agendas. Yeah, well, keep in mind that it is all a function of consciousness and viewed from a higher level of awareness, from this higher level of unity, there is only oneness at that point. What we see as uh, as good versus evil, and furthermore, it's good needs to win, you know, if you're, if you're – uh, uh, rooting for the good guys like, like we are uh, – you can see the same event, yet you're going to see it entirely, completely different. What we see as separate f- things functioning, that's on the level of unity, everything is working together. Everything, in fact, from that level of awareness uh, is serving as a timing agent. This is all leading somewhere. It's all going somewhere, and frankly, I think it's all going to turn out uh, uh, really well, uh, much, much better than uh, probably we have, we have a right to hope or expect it to turn out because um, I'm well aware that uh, uh, we are – well, we're living life consistent with a Chinese proverb. You know, the one that says, if we don't change our direction, <laughs> we're likely to end up where we're mm-hmm. headed. You know that one. And uh, we're definitely on a collision course with disaster. But there is a larger scheme of things, a larger order of things. And from that perspective, uh, these seemingly separate events are all playing out together. Everything from that perspective is a function of timing. Mm-hmm. I mean, the what I mean by that is that you've got the dark forces and the light forces are actually working together. See, uh, the forces of light, they're doing everything they can to get us evolved, whether we're a species or a planet or whatever, as quickly as possible. But the forces of darkness, well, their job is to do everything they can to keep us stuck in fear and limitation for as long as they can. And they're very good Mm -hmm. at it. That's their job. That's their role. But viewed from a higher level, from the level of unity, there's only one spirit moving through all of life. No matter how good it may seem, no matter how bad it might seem, it's still just this oneness, as above, so below. So from that perspective, these seemingly separate entities that are at total odds, that are at war with each other, are actually working together. And this is the timing aspect in all of it. And so for us, you know, we recognize the importance of timing. Uh, If you move when the timing is not right, you know, uh, you're talking about a rather disastrous situation if the baby is born at six months Mm -hmm. or 15 months. How about nine months when the timing is right? That's when things move. And so um, hopefully that uh, helps to tie this together just a little bit yeah yeah that's definitely well said and that makes a lot of sense i like the analogy of the baby being born and we talked earlier about the existence of or the influx of two external species and we were talking about the martians which are we say they're the logic-based external Mm. beings they're the global elite in a sense of today what happened to the hebrews still here and uh, and uh, they're they're still here. I mean, that's about all I can say. Right. Of course, we know the name, but are we talking about? Are we using the word Hebrews the same today as in the context of this outsider race? Yeah, it's where they came from. If you believe Thoth. Wow. So that gets into the whole idea, or their mythology, or their religion of being chosen people of some some a different type of person, I should say. 
Yeah, yeah, and according to Thoth, back in the day, this is the mistake that they made, believing that they, in fact, were the chosen people, which, I mean, uh, is really a pretty good definition of duality or polarity consciousness. Mm -hmm. And and ultimately, that's going to lead you uh, down the road to disaster, standing apart from and thinking you're, I mean, if you're the chosen race, you're better than, you know, somebody else. Right, which is definitely the way the elite think. Yeah, and that's just, I mean, that's just the grand illusion. And so, uh, evidently, uh, they, they messed up badly enough to create a life that was probably unspeakably awful. <laughs> and so, uh, I'm sure it's not the first time it's happened that life, that meaning, meaning higher life forms, galactic command, whomever, whatever, said, uh, sorry guys, you're going to have to come back and start over. Right. Which is exactly what happened to us when Atlantis fall. Fell. I mean, we had to start, you know, start over, square one. If, you've had, if you have your memory erased and you've fallen down the dimensional wavelength till you've landed in this dark, dense place called third dimensional polarity consciousness, man, you are starting over. And, uh, and uh, so evidently, it's, it's done um, probably on a regular basis. And that's not to say that... Uh, Probably the opposite has occurred also where uh, races of beings have been bumped up a bit. You know, skip a grade, uh, go directly. <laughs> right, right. Go directly from college to from the eighth grade. <laughs> See how well you do. Of right? course. I suppose that's happened too. And it, it seems to me that when it, we're looking at the puppet masters, uh, a lot of this or a lot of researchers talk about it going back to Egypt, going back to Samaria with ideas like fractional reserve banking. Of course, that's a form of alchemy in a sense. Um, and it is a definite tool for keeping the planet kind of enslaved and keeping us away from the abundance of the world by instituting a middleman, which is the dollar. Could we say that the elite are a mix of these two with two different approaches? A mix of these two outside sources. Well, uh, fractional reserve banking, AMA Rothschild said it all, give me control of a nation's currency, and I care not who makes its laws. Right. So that's, that's how you, you uh, uh, covertly control behind, behind the scenes. Oh, of course. Who are, who are these guys? Uh, well, uh, hopefully, eventually, they're going to evolve out of it, but they haven't done it yet. And uh, the best I can say in answer to that question is, again, to go back to the whole Martian thing. I mean, these guys are Martian. They have Martian blood in them to the nth degree. And, uh, and um, ultimately, ultimately doesn't work, but uh, they're still in the process of discovering that. Wow. But, um, I don't know. I'm frankly not too worried about those guys anymore because I think that uh, in many ways, in spite of ourselves, uh, that things are going to turn out just fine. Uh, and what I mean by that, and this, you know, this might be the biggest leap of faith of, of, of all, but what I mean by that is that if, if you can accept – I mean, go out on a limb and just accept what we've been talking about for the past couple hours right now, then you can kind of begin to grab on to the, the possibility that there is a consciousness grid that's above the earth, that's alive, it's a well, and it's functioning, and at some point, at some day, it's going to allow us to evolve into a level of awareness that is so far beyond anything that we can even imagine today that, uh, man, it's going to be fun. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I really do feel it's some – well, I'll tell you what, we're – either going to destroy ourselves and our planet or the only way we don't, the only way we make it through all of this is to step into that next level of unity consciousness. So it's going to be real interesting. It's going to be a very interesting ride. And uh, uh, I'm an optimist. I think we're going to make it through. But uh, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that uh, uh, we need to change our direction and do it quick. Amen. They say it's darkest before the dawn, and I really hope you're right. Uh, <laughs> I really hope things do take a positive swing at that last minute. Maybe that's when the ascended masters will step in. 
<laughs> yeah, well, and in the meantime, the, the thing that you and I can do is to recognize that the greatest thing that you can do, the greatest thing that I can do individually and collectively to heal the planet is to heal ourselves. Mm -hmm. Everything is a function of consciousness. And so you begin to apply this on a, on a personal level. You know, what does it mean to be here now, to be here in the moment? What does it mean to begin to lift some of the veils of I can't and I've been giving my power away, not only to doctors and other outside authority figures, but what does it really mean? this as above, so below, and to start looking inside for the answers. Mm -hmm. That's where the adventure begins. And that's how we're going to get from point A to point B. Point A, where we are right now, point B, the new grid has taken us to this new level of awareness. Uh, we've evolved into the fourth dimension, and life is good. <laughs> but you got to create it being good right here, right now, because right. life is not a destination, it is a journey. So smile, uh, you're in the right place at the right time, and uh, it's been great talking to you. <laughs> it has, it has, Bob. This has been a definite blast, very interesting. I'm thankful for your time. Uh, before we do completely wrap this up, would you like to tell the listeners how they can hear more of you or pick up your books? Oh, yeah. Uh, just go to my website, bobfrizzell.com. And, and by the way, I, I have to acknowledge that I was I was real sure you were going to mispronounce my name, but you got it right. <laughs> you did your homework. I don't right. know how, but you got it right. And I appreciate that. So just go to bobfrizzell.com, and that's how you can check me out. Uh, F-R-I-S-S-E-L-L. -L, that's how you spell my name. So I got my books and uh, a lot of good stuff up on my website, and you can, I guess, find out more about me just by going there. Awesome. Well, thanks again, man. Very appreciative. I know this is a popular alternative history, and I'm glad that <laughs> you could give us the chronology of it. Uh, it's not something we hear every day. Obviously, we never learned it in school, and <laughs> nope. I think it has some fascinating threads. So keep doing what you do to wake people up and take care of yourself out there. All right, man? Well, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Appreciate it.